about democracy in Poland. <laughs> uh, usually we don't associate the question of radical democracy so much uh, with the question of borders. Uh, it's something that uh, has emerged in the literature, um, in political theory in particular, um, the last two years, uh, although it is one of the most uh, important and fundamental questions to, cons to consider that really poses um, uh, the, the, the problem of the limits, the boundaries of democracy at the very center uh, of political reflection and uh, political action. Uh, we will have um, uh, three, uh, four uh, very interesting um, contributions from a wide range of, uh, of approaches and even uh, uh, geographical areas. The first uh, uh, speaker is uh, Julian Cocansalo, who is a PhD student in the Department of, Politi of Politics here at the New School for Social Research. Uh, she's working uh, on a dissertation on uh, revolution and law in the thought of Hannah Arendt. And also she's conducting research in gender studies at the University of Helsinki in Finland as a member of the Academy of Finland Research Project. Uh, her main uh, research interest uh, include, uh, of course, uh, the political thought of Hannah Arendt, uh, the philosophy of revolutionary action, uh, statelessness and human rights, uh, as well as the Israeli-Palestine conflict, and I think in her paper some of those issues uh, will be combined um, and included. Uh, the second speaker is Andreas Hetzel, who teaches philosophy at uh, the universities of Darmstadt and uh, Innsbruck, Innsbruck in Germany. Uh, he studied uh, philosophy and German uh, literature uh, in Darmstadt uh, University. Uh, his research interests include political philosophy, contemporary French theory, critical theory, German idealism, and uh, ancient philosophy. Uh, he's working presently on theories of rhetoric and philosophies of uh, language, and also uh, he's a very um, insightful thinker of uh, radical democracy. In the past, uh, we had the chance to, to debate some aspects of um, radical democracy uh, with some uh, very interesting and innovative ideas. Uh, uh, while published, um, uh, co-edited um, 11 uh, uh, books, uh, and uh, he has some uh, uh, books also on the concept of language uh, in classical rhetoric and uh, modern pragmatics, uh, and a book on the concept of culture, and uh, I will uh, uh, try to orient your attention to his work on, on, on radical democracy, especially in the continental uh, tradition. Uh, Andreas uh, Oberpantaker also uh, comes uh, to us from Germany. He's an assistant professor at the Department of Philosophy uh, in Innsbruck, a core faculty member at the UNESCO Chair for Peace Studies, University of Innsbruck, and a, a senior lecturer for philosophy, sociology, and peace studies in Thailand and India. Uh, he has many recent uh, publications. Uh, some of them uh, include uh, Of Limits, uh, Elastic Border Regimes, and the Visual Politics of Making Things Public, uh, Activist Media and the Biopolitics. So, as I see, there are also concerns about media politics in relation to democratic politics as well. And uh, finally, uh, the last uh, uh, presentation is by Maria Canetti, who is uh, an Alstul uh, Fellow in, the, in Politics uh, and PhD candidates at the New School for Social Research. Her research uh, interests are mainly migration, uh, citizenship, uh, and visual politics, so there are some uh, uh, overlapping uh, uh, themes here. Um, and also she has done some work on, on uh, the French uh, political thinker uh, Ronsier, among others. And uh, the discussion that we present at the time of his intervention. So let's uh, begin with uh, uh, Julia on the sites of resistance. So I'm going to show some slides, so I'll be talking from here. Uh, so last summer, last July, I was, I was working actually at one of these uh, refugee camps in Lebanon, Palestinian refugee camps. So this is my first attempt to try to think about this experience in terms of my academic uh, research. So um, what I'm going to be doing with my paper consists of two parts. First, there's a uh, description of what is at stake at these Lebanese refugee camps. And the second part is more of a theoretical discussion um, about the, the camp as a site of political resistance. So I'm going to begin by a quote uh, by Hannah Arendt from her 1943 essay, We Refugees. A refugee used to be a person driven to seek refuge because of some act committed or some political opinion held. While it's true we had to seek refuge, uh, but we committed no acts, and most of us never dreamt of having any radical political opinion. With us, the meaning of the term refugee has changed. 
Now refugees are those of us who have been so unfortunate as to arrive in a new country without means and have to be helped by refugee committees. So Palestinians form nearly 10% of the population in Lebanon. Nearly all are descendants of people who fled or were forced, forcefully expelled from the historic Palestine in 1947 and 1948 during the Nakba. In contrast to the Armenian genocide survivors and their descendants, for instance, who enjoy full citizenship rights and have their own Armenian quarters in the capital of Beirut, Palestinians live in 12 refugee camps scattered around Lebanon. Although these sites are called refugee camps, they're actually cramped suburbs that lack basic infrastructure, such as proper sewerage systems, electricity, or health care. The Burj al Barajni camp in Beirut, for instance, is built on an area of one square kilometer, yet according to the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees, it inhabits more than 16,000 people. And I'll show you one slide. So this is uh, the site of the refugee camp from the construction work area. It's like seventh or eighth floor. And the young man here is my friend Omar, who is a Palestinian refugee who lives in this camp. So you can see how big this is. And on the outskirts of that photo, you can see actual uh, capital city of, of Beirut. There's only one health center and one senior citizen home in the camp. During the summertime, the temperature in Beirut raises well above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but due to constant power outages in the camp, all houses and buildings such as schools lack proper air conditioning. At times, the only hospital is closed due to power outage and lack of light. During the winter time, heavy rains cause the old sewage system to flood and the narrow alleys of the camp turn into rivers of drain water. Even worse than the extremely poor conditions of the camps is the continuing hostility and violence that Palestinians experience due to the military surveillance and policing carried out by the Lebanese government. Some of the camps have been entirely destroyed more than once and then rebuilt again by the Palestinians. The Lebanese civil war, for instance, had devastating effects on the Palestinian population, as we can remember from the Saudi Shatila massacres that took place in 1982. Furthermore, in 2006, this particular camp suffered severely under Israel's bombing of Beirut. So I'll show you some other slides. This is what it looks like typically inside the camp. So the alleys are very narrow. All the electric wires and all the cables and everything is just twisted and handmade into these big lumps that run basically above your head. And some people have died because of uh, electric shocks from these lines. Um, um, and then there's no proper garbage or sewage system, so if it rains, like you can see, there's like water on the on the concrete uh, floor. So this is what you call the street inside this, this camp. Here's a picture of the Haifa Hospital, which is the only proper hospital in the camp, and this is uh, one hospital for about 16,000 people. And then here's a picture of a school. This is where I was teaching. Uh, I, was, I was a coordinator of a teaching team, but these are some of the uh, students during uh, power outage. So we didn't have any light because we didn't have electricity. But we, have, we had uh, batteries and stuff, so we did other stuff. But this is the conditions under which these students in school are, are learning. So, uh, Um, because even after 64, so, so yeah, these people have been in exile for 64 years now. So even after 64 years in exile, documented Palestinians in Lebanon continue to carry the legal status of refugee. The Lebanese government actively denies them access to political rights, civil rights, as well as employment and social services enjoyed by Lebanese, Lebanese citizens. The Lebanese government is itself fragmented with a fragile balance of power between various religious groups. It serves the interest of the Lebanese government not to assimilate Palestinians to the Lebanese population because the general attitude is that Israel and the United Nations and the international community should take responsibility for solving the refugee situation. The complex political history of the ELL involvement in Lebanese and Syrian affairs further complicates the situation. Given the situation, the camps are thus left entirely dependent on UN and NGO aid. This evening, those generations of Palestinians who are born in the Lebanese camps lack citizenship, 
the fact that statelessness shapes the lives of Palestinians even in exile outside the Israeli occupation. Since Israel denies these refugees the right to return, and since no solution to the Israel-Palestinian conflict seems to be taking place in the near future, Palestinians in Lebanon form a formulation trapped in permanent exile. In this sense, they have not only lost their land and homes, but are being robbed of the future as well. I'm now coming to my second part. Nevertheless, the unique situation of indefinite exile constitutes a very peculiar political temporality in space. Historically, the camp is a post-colonial site, a byproduct of British involvement in Palestine. Today, however, it is an instinctive space, space that is at the same time inside the sovereign state, on its territory, inside its borders, and yet entirely excluded from its legal and political structure. Yet, despite the extremely harsh conditions under which Palestinian refugees in Lebanon spend their daily lives, they are by no means simply victims or mere passive sufferers of extreme systematic oppression. I contend that the camp itself can be theorized as a visible space of resistance to the ex Israeli occupation. Having waited 64 years for their right to return, and by continuing to do so, Palestinian civilians <coughs> refuse to accept any other solution to the situation than the legal option of the right to return. Meanwhile, the once refugee tent camps that were originally put up by the Red Cross Society have become permanent suburbs with a rich and wide cultural tradition. Children know which villages their great-grandparents came from, and the history of the Nakba is passed on from generation to generation. Palestinian refugees distinguish themselves from the Lebanese through a specific Palestinian Arabic accent. Furthermore, local dances at Stepke are performed everywhere in the camps, and the tradition of cooking dishes from various parts of historic Palestine is a significant part of national identity and belonging. The power of storytelling and poetry is intensified by the fact that the Bush of Bush Shemali and Rashidiyah camps in southern Lebanon are so close to the Israeli border that the camp dwellers are able to see their occupied original homeland along the coastline. So when there are, there's a military sort of like military officers who are uh, watching the entrances of these camps, so you can't exit without proper uh, permission from them. Yet from the school windows and buildings, you can actually see across the sea this land unfolding, which is uh, reflected in a lot of the, the poetry and, and songs and writings. Uh, in his photographic essay, After the Last Sky, Palestinian Lives, Edward Said reflects on the exile Palestinian experience as a struggle of creating an inside or a home as an outsider in society. Quote, you try to get used to living among outsiders and endlessly attempting to define what's on your inside. Unquote. According to Said, Palestinians are everywhere defined as outsiders through their otherness. Yet, at the same time, this creates a sense of belonging and a sense of community. Even Said's reflections on the experience of the outsider as constitutive, uh, as constitutive of Palestinian identity and borrowing the concept from the political philosophy of Hannah Arendt, I, should, I suggest that the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon can be seen as a form, as a community of conscious pariah. In her analysis of the history of anti-Semitism, Arendt makes a conceptual distinction between the pariah and the part of it. According to her, marginalized groups of people, German Jews in this case, had two ways of coping with their vulnerable position in society and in their plight for political emancipation. One was to assimilate to the main society and thus attempt to integrate and become social members of that society, with the price of neglecting one's own difference. The other strategy, that of conscious pariahdom, was to accept the challenge and responsibility of being an outsider and thus remain in the margins of society, embracing one's difference and fighting for full political and legal recognition. Arendt never limited the concept of the pariah to the Jewish people alone, but insisted that any marginalized or persecuted group of people could take on this identity position in their struggle for political emancipation. Arendt traces the origin of the Palestinian refugee problem to the failures in the system of the sovereign nation state. In the origins of totalitarianism, Arendt shows how the First World War led to a massive production of famous people. The problem for the newly founded European states was thus that the only model for the inclusion of these minorities in the political community was based on the model of the sovereign nation state. Thus, the alternatives were various attempts to assimilate minorities into newly established nation state by force. This is a quote by Arendt, a very famous quote on the problems of this. 
quote, the minority treaty said in plain language what until then had been only implied by in the working system of nation states, namely that only nationals could be citizens. Only people of the same national origin could enjoy the full protection of legal institutions. That persons of different nationality needed some law of exception until or unless they were completely assimilated and divorced from their origin, end quote. The solution provided by Western powers to the question regarding Jewish refugees after the World Wars was to establish a new Jewish nation state. But, and this is again a rent, quote, the solution to the Jewish question merely produced a new category of refugees, the Arabs, thereby increasing the number of stateless and rightless by another 700 or 800,000 people, end quote. Today, this number has reached millions. The same logic that underlies the minority treaties is prevalent in the current version of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, since these are rights that are based on the model of citizenship. Only people who are already members of, of a juridical political community can gain access to human rights. On the other hand, the principle of sovereignty also gives the state the right to deprive people of their citizenship. Thus, the state structure itself produces stateless people within the state. Whenever stateless people appear, they are excluded from their rights because they do not belong to the legal and political structure of the state they belong. In the case of refugees, it is up to the hospitality of the welcoming country, such as Lebanon in this case, whether it wants to accept the refugees or not. Stateless people, such as the Palestinian exiles in Lebanon, cannot even claim rights because they have no institutional principle to appeal to. Today, as in the 1940s, the responsibility of protecting the human rights and dignity of refugees is thrown on the shoulders of NGOs and international organizations as, such as the UN Relief Agencies. In the case of the Palestinians in Lebanon, the options of any kind of choice between pariah dome and ass assimilation are, of course, extremely limited, and caution should be taken in order to not romanticize the idea of resistance through pariah dome. However, even if they were ever given the option to integrate to the Lebanese society as full citizens, Palestinian national identity is still centered on the struggle for the UN recognized right to return, the right to compensation of lost lands, and for the right to a home within the borders of Israel Palestine, not Lebanon. The whole point in the struggle is full recognition as Palestinians. As has been recently theorized by Judith Butler, the notion of Palestinian nationality and national belonging raises important political questions regarding the concept of sovereignty and the nation state. Palestinians in exile are living in a diaspora and are thus located in numerous different countries, such as Syria and Jordan, for example. And here's a quote from Butler. Historically considered, then, the nation of Palestine is not bound by any existing or negotiated borders, which means not only that rights and obligations extend beyond existing boundaries, but that existing boundaries are the effect of illegal land appropriation, end quote. While the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon accepting a Palestinian state within the current borders is thus the same as accepting the illegal settler occupation of Palestine by Israel. Both Said and Butler hold that due to the Palestinian diaspora, Serious consideration has to be given to the thought of a binational Arab Jewish federated state as an alternative to the old nation state model, which once again draws from the problematic notions uh, that I've discussed before. The numerous complex problems addressed by Said, Iran, and Butler thus boils down to the question of how we should understand nationality, national belonging, and human rights outside the model of the sovereign nation state. It is of immediate importance that the discussion and negotiations regarding the eventual solution to the Israeli-Palestine conflict take seriously into consideration the roles of Palestinians living in so-called refugee camps, not only in Lebanon, but also in neighboring Syria, Jordan, and elsewhere. So it's not only a question of the occupied territories of Palestine or within the, the, the nation of Israel, but all these millions of people who live in these unbearable conditions somewhere outside. What are we going to do with them and how do we integrate them and where? By studying the Palestinian refugee camps, we can learn new ways to articulate conceptions of nationality and belonging that move beyond the traditional understanding of the state as a sovereign institute bound to one people, one religion, and a territory that is protected by military borders and walls.
much for the kind uh, invitation to this conference. Uh, I think um, some of my thoughts will perfectly fit uh, to the former paper, because um, I also uh, start with this um, Israel-Palestine uh, situation and um, try to develop some uh, thoughts on um, the importance of borders in nowadays politics and on possibilities of democratization of, of borders. And I, in this, I, I uh, follow um, Etienne Balibar. For a fleeting moment in history, the globalization pushes of the late 20th century, the process of European unification, and the opening of the Iron Curtain were associated with the hope of an epochal change. The political institution of borders seemed about to become obsolete altogether. Throughout the 1990s, many observers still believed that the victory of Western liberal, liberal democracy over all alternative models of society would eventually fulfill the old cosmopolitan vision of a world uh, without any borders. And this uh, makes the current renaissance of the border uh, all the more astonishing. Hardly ever in history have borders been as massive and as such immense uh, in um, their discrimination, discriminating power as the borders, for example, between um, the uh, Palestinian uh, territories and Israel, uh, between uh, Mexico and the US, um, between the Spanish enclaves in Northern Africa and uh, Morocco, or uh, at the European coast of the Mediterranean, to name uh, a few examples. Moreover, the concept of the border also recurs within the territories of nation states in multiple ways. Based on the thoughts of Balibar, I want to inquire in my paper whether and if so how borders can be democratized. Above all, the answer to this question would have to take into account the claims of those affected by the consequences and coercions uh, of our border policies. Uh, my paper is uh, divided into two parts. In the first part, I um, uh, uh, take a kind of diagnostic look uh, at the function of current border regimes, and uh, I think I will, I will skip this uh, here, and I will concentrate on the second point, which uh, deals with the question of a possible democratization of all this. Uh, just uh, one uh, uh, um, thought to, to the first uh, complex, to, to the uh, diagnostic look uh, at borders. Um, uh, despite all a few caution regarding the historical comparability of border regimes and uh, architectures, I think we should be very um, careful with, with comparing different borders in, in different times and uh, different places, but uh, despite this, this caution, uh, the wall uh, which I've shown between the West Bank uh, and uh, the Israel territory uh, is maybe more um, uh, than just a, a singular in incident. It's uh, the expression of a general <coughs> tendency. In this book, Hollow Land, uh, Israel's Architecture of Occupation, which was published in 2007, Eyal Weizmann describes the border zone defined by the uh, wall in Israel as a, I quote, laboratory of the extremes, end of quote. In this laboratory, techniques and forms of knowledge, the classical European colonialism, are being tested regarding their efficiency for new forms of especially social segregation. More than anything, the wall was a social line. So, uh, I quote uh, Weizmann, the main search of the colonization of the West Bank in the 1980s coincided with the reading area the flight of the American middle classes and their fortification behind protective walls. Those formations setting themselves against poverty and violence they have themselves produced. Separation, seclusion, and visual, visual control, the settlements, checkpoints, walls, and other security measures are also the last gesture to perfect the politics of fear. So I could say that Weizmann analyzes, analyzes this um, Border regime as a, a complex dispositive, which also includes um, 
cams, uh, forms of visual uh, control, uh, and so on, which is not only typical for this uh, Eastern situation, but uh, also appears within our um, uh, Western uh, cities. For uh, the Canadian politologist uh, Azar Amizadi, uh, the right of a community to sanction unilateral criteria for membership is incompatible with, um, the, 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 I quote him, uh, democratic theory of popular sovereignty. Anyone who accepts a genuinely democratic theory of political legitimation domestically is thereby committed to rejecting the unilateral domestic right to control and close the state's boundaries. Whether boundaries in the civic sense which regulate membership or in the territorial sense which regulate movement. So he, he just points out that there is a kind of, of tension between democracy and the border. You know, I now, now want to, to um, show you what this exactly means. Um, since borders exert coercion on those that um, they exclude, under the democratic conditions, those who are affected by the consequences of this coercion must be involved in the processes of the institutionalization and legitimization of these borders. Since antiquity, the claim for a democratization of social relations and institutions has been closely linked to the questioning of borders. And in particular, and in particular um, on uh, orders um, uh, which sanction the uh, orders of uh, property and, and uh, ownership. In chapter 11 of his uh, Atinaya and Politeia, Aristotle describes the primal scene of the establishment of uh, democracy in Athens, the reform, uh, reform of Solon. I quote now from uh, Aristotle, because the land was in the hands of the few, those who possess no land became increasingly increasingly dependent on those who did. The impoverished rural population was forced to raise loans for which they were held liable with their own bodies. Because the multitude was enslaved by a minority, the people rose against the upper class. As Aristotle reports, Solon's strategy consisted in recognizing the demand of the people as legitimate and release those who had no share from their liabilities. In the context of this uh, narration, Aristotle cites a poem of Solon, in which the statesman describes how he had constituted the people as political units. I quote uh, Solon uh, in Aristotle, I swept the pillars, broadcast, planted there, and made thee free, who had been slave of the Lord. In the quote, by doing so, Solon had uh, enacted a cytostea, a universal cancellation of debts, that themselves were linked with territorial boundaries as well as distribution of land. Solon had, um, has it clear that the pillars used to represent debts and to, uh, to thus transfer land from the poor to the rich are at the same time landmarks that generate exclusions and prevent the demos in constituting itself. By preventing exclusion through the cancellation of debts, Solon also prevents the civil war. In doing so, he himself became a kind of landmark. I quote again Aristotle, but I stood for the landmark in the midst and bared the tools from Babel. The democratic intervention of Solon consists in limiting the border itself between those who have a share and those who don't, uh, by putting himself in its very middle and, and uh, in its very middle, um, and not by uh, uh, just cutting um, the, the, the borderline um, into two pieces, but by cutting him in a, uh, in a horizontal way, uh, like in this uh, famous uh, story of the cut of Apelius, this uh, ancient uh, painter. Today, the thoughts of Panibar, uh, is linking an analysis of the border as a dispositive, which an analysis of border as a normative claim for democratization, points in a very similar direction. Alibar understands the border as an institution which primarily means mm, that, uh, I quote him, natural borders, the great myths of, of the foreign policy of nation states, have never existed anywhere. For him, today's globalization is precisely not the overcoming of national borders, but, but rather much their permanent reproduction. I, I quote him, 
a world economy that is taking the shape of the universal market cannot, as opposed to the liberal rules, for, uh, form a homogeneous entity without any boundaries. It must necessarily be divided into a plurality of political unities that allow for concentration of economic power as well as a defending of positions of unearned income from monopolies through extra economic means. There's no market without, without monopolies, no monopoly without political or juridical means of coercion, which in practice means the existence of national states and, um, of course, uh, borders. The uh, protagonists of globalization open the borders uh, for streams of data and products while at the same time trying to limit streams of people by drawing um, on the co co coercive power of the world. For Bolivar, the contemporary state is indistinguishable uh, from the nation form, which in turn requires and generates a nationalist ide ideology. I quote him again. Nationalism is an organic ideology that corresponds to the national institution, and this institution rests upon the formulation of the rule of exclusion, of visible or invisible borders materialized in laws and practices. Exclusion, or at least unequal, preferential access to particular goods and rights, depending on whether one is a, a national or a foreigner, or belongs uh, to the community or not, is the very essence uh, of the nation. And this is even true for the, uh, for the um, European Union. Malibar uh, always talks about a new, new form of the uh, European apartheid, which uh, distinguishes between uh, Europeans and non-Europeans. The nation form reproduces itself by practices of exclusion, for example, deportation, but even more by practices of exclusion. Quote uh, again. The border, um, borders mark the, I quote, point where, even in the most democratic of states, the status of citizen returns to the condition of the subject, where political participa participation gives way to the rule of police. They are the absolutely non-democratic or discretionary condition of democratic institutions, end of quote. Nationhood institutionalizes the principle of exclusion. It produces strangers and outsiders. From Bolivar's point of view, this is particularly true in the case of Europe. Europe currently sees a um, supernatural consolidation of the nation state, along with all its problems, the nation state, which might add um, uh, by taking into account the Frontex operations of our days, that stands in the tradition of uh, Hobbesian sovereignty rather than uh, in the tradition of uh, natural law. While Hugo Grotius, um, a proponent of the, nation, uh, of the natural law tradition conceptualizes uh, this law as an international law between states, as for example the law of the open sea, refers to those um, uh, states as the happiest, I quote, whose bounds were not determined by sea and sword, but which, which has justice for its boundaries, end of quote. By end the board, uh, but beyond the borders of the option state, uh, there's um, uh, Nothing than um, the despotism of the state of nature. Precisely because the sovereignty of the so sovereign is absolute, the relation of the sovereign state to everyone and everything outside its territory can only be a, a constant state of war. That for what manifests itself, I quote, in armed branches, just like the European Union borders uh, we can observe today. <coughs> Against the militaristic top-down Europeanization, uh, Bolivar holds up the vision of a European demos that rejects classification based on the criterion of national or European citizenship. In this context, he plans for a democratization of borders. This is a paradoxical demand as it implies the democratization of a, I quote, deeply anti-democratic institution on which the existence of both the state and the nation form depends. Well, again, democratization the border would thus mean democratizing some of the non-democratic conditions of democracy itself that always come between the people and its theoretical sovereignty. Regarding the European unification process, this means that it cannot be conceptualized as a solidly vertical <coughs> process, but requires a horizontal supplement to emergence of European demos and the constitution of the European public. 
More than anything, the way that Europe is handling refugees along its borders will tell whether this demos and thus Europe itself would be possible. Europe will be possible if it establishes borders that remain, remain insuperable for refugees and uh, possible in turn only if, uh, if it's capable of recognizing the flow of ref ref refugees um, as an image and effect of its own history. In ethical terms, the democratization of borders can only be successful if it's pursued from both sides of the border, when those who are inside and those who are outside discover common concerns and a common language. As an example, Balibar mentions the French Saint-Papier who have pushed into illegality in the 90s by the Pasqua and the Hay legislation, but later broke the enforced silence to publicity demand the status that is consistent with their role in French society. Alibar asks, I quote, what can be done in today's world to democratize the institution of the border, that is, to put it at the service of men and submit it to their collective control, making it an object of their sovereignty, rather than allowing um, it to subject them to powers over which they have no control, explanation mark. This question cannot be answered quickly, nor um, on an entirely theoretical level. There's no easy and non-ambivalent solution, but at best one that tries to find normative guidance in the practices of resistance of those subjected to the coercion of power. So, so I, I think uh, we can only find an, an answer um, <coughs> by uh, researching uh, uh, strategies of, of resistance and strategies of questioning for the needs. whose analyses are to a large extent congruent with the money bars. In this context, steps um, for the establishment, I quote him, of cosmopolitan democratic institutions in which borders uh, receive actual justification addressed to both citizens, citizens and foreigners. We must ask, however, by which criteria this cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism uh, of, of the institutions could be measured, and whether such criteria do not hold the danger of new it is not without irony that Abisade cites the EU of all things as an example of such an uh, cosmopolitan institution. We come uh, to the end. Mm. The democratization of the border of the Balibar does not mean its abolition altogether, which would lead to a war of all against all. Democracy, as Aristotle once put it, means that everybody uh, is able to do everything, that no one can be excluded, and, and that no thing um, can be uh, uh, stated without uh, a question. According to this notion of democracy, processes of democratization should always and perhaps primarily aim at an archaic, a boundless and borderless state, that articulate objection against the uh, 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 each naturalness of borders in the name of those deprived of any share by these borders. The struggles of those um, with no share, outsiders, migrants, stateless individuals, <coughs> their attempts to raise their voices could provide normative guidance for our efforts and our democratization as they allow us to uncover the best of our European traditions and thus uh, question uh, the uh, alleged identity of Europe. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for making this conference possible and also for these inspiring papers um, that allow me now to engage uh, with some of the thoughts by trying to improvise also my, my own argument. So I have prepared um, a PowerPoint presentation, but since it's not very spectacular, I leave it uh, for a while and maybe I will return to it at the end because I have uh, prepared some images. I would also like to thank Andreas for uh, the introduction. However, you put me in the rather uncomfortable position now to defend, even though I am an Italian by passport, the, the Austrian border. Uh, <laughs> Innsbruck, Innsbruck is located in Austria, not in Germany. Oh, um, but, uh, German, <laughs> yeah. but at the same time, uh, this gives me also the opportunity to well, bring up 
um, um, a very general question. To what extent does it make sense nowadays to speak of borders, especially also in Europe? Um, to what extent is um, the expression border linked to some implicit assumptions, to Euclidean assumptions of space? And to what extent is, especially nowadays, uh, European, Europe's governmentality not so much defined perhaps by an Euclidean concept of political space, but by rather something which is more dynamic, um, some would say plastic, elastic, fluid. And in this sense, I would like to return to this um, traditional concept of frontier. Uh, not so much because I believe that the frontier has a particular essence which allows to distinguish between two essentially different terms, but I think that it involves um, an imagination which um, opens up also different spaces of exploration. And therefore, in my paper, I would like to insist on, on, on the notion of uh, the frontier, and I would like to argue that uh, what becomes visible nowadays, especially in the European Union and around it, is a, a frontier regime, which poses also some very particular uh, challenges to the question, how does one democratize spaces? Um, because what is at stake in the end, uh, according to, to my argument, and uh, it's not just my argument, but I can also link it to uh, different uh, scholars and also different things that become visible nowadays, is, is very much the space of appearance. The space of appearance, again, not so much as something which is guaranteed by the state as one particular institution, but the space um, of appearance which becomes threatened the moment you have millions of people in, in Europe, but also in the United States, who are there without having any opportunity of becoming visible. Um, we know that, um, and there is this strange also a new research project which is um, named Counting the Uncountables. Uh, I don't think that those who conceived this project had an idea of Rancière, but it's again, it's, a, it's also absurd that you have a, a research project which is named Counting the Uncountables, and the very question that is being raised in this project is, I mean, how do we take into account how many people there are living in, in the European Union um, that uh, have no right to be there? And um, similar estimates are also made for the United States, and again, it's, it's, uh, it involves the very difficulty of uh, conceptualizing such studies, I mean, because there you cannot really rely on any particular um, <coughs> empirical study, because uh, if it is true that uh, situations of illegality contribute to uh, a generalized disappearance, then it puts into question the very methods of research, um, because you create situations where people tend not to appear in public, because this threatens their very existence, they can be expelled, they can be exported, and therefore it's also very difficult to research such situations. So I would like also to argue in my paper that what is at stake in the end, uh, especially in the European Union at the moment, is very much the space of, of appearance. Um, this is related to conditions which make it, especially for people who don't have um, a residence permit or who have rather a precarious residence permit, very difficult to appear in spaces and also to present themselves as, uh, as political subjects. Because basically they are not just risking this or that, but they are risking themselves and their very existence the moment <coughs> they are also, the, the moment they can be uh, deported. So the, the bottom line of my, my argument is that um, even though the slogan that is very often used in Europe, that there is something like a fortress Europe, is appealing uh, because it can generate also a lot of passions and uh, collective resistance. I would also argue that in phenological and in political terms, it is misleading because it suggests that there is something like um, a, a, a massive European wall which fends off um, persons who don't have, um, who have no right to enter the European Union or who have no right to stay for a prolonged period of time in the European Union. Um, what becomes certainly visible um, in, in Europe is that there are indeed, there is indeed a multitude of persons who is already there and who are somehow involved, um, especially also in economic terms. We find situations that are as extreme as uh, there are some who are completely denied any work, who have to wait for years because they dare to apply for political asylum and then they are caught up in in uh, legal processes and in the end the, the 
the general outcome is that <coughs> they are being denied political asylum, whereas other people are being forced to work under conditions that one could historically certainly also compare to conditions of slavery. So we, we find these two extremes, especially nowadays in Europe, that you have some people who are out of work, who are basically condemned to wait for years, and others that are working under, under extreme conditions. And this again creates the fuzzy situation that it's very difficult to say uh, what extent the European Union is a, a, a massive fortress which uh, has no interest in also involving people uh, as, um, as simpapeles, as sans-papiers, as uh, clandestini, as, as illegale. At least in economic terms, one could certainly argue that there is a strong interest that is connected also to a certain tendency to deregulate um, the t typical um, uh, work sphere in terms of the contracts, in terms of uh, social insurance, etc., etc. So I would argue that um, what becomes visible, especially nowadays in Europe, is not so much a, a fortress, but a, a frontier regime, which works in, in slightly different terms. And I, I would also argue that um, the, the political sense or the, the logic of such frontier regimes is that two major concepts which are usually linked to a, a state-based understanding of democracy are diffused. Uh, one concept is that of jurisdiction. It becomes also visible that in, in many spaces it, it is rather unclear who has the jurisdiction over the spaces and jurisdiction is traditionally linked to the concept of sovereignty and there is um, a clear interest also of a, of, a, of a multitude of states of not creating jurisdiction because this would then pose the very question who is responsible for these situations, who is responsible for uh, the mass disappearance, for example, in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, also in this sense, um, in political terms, it, much, it, it is much more useful to create uh, a, a generalized zone, zone of insecurity where no particular state is claiming jurisdiction over this zone and another um, important term is that of uh, accountability, which is especially linked to uh, democratic institutions. So I, I would also argue that within this uh, European frontier zones, these two major concepts, that of jurisdiction, that of accountability, became much more fuzzy. It became much more difficult to engage with these concepts and to, to hold states accountable. Because many of the actors that are involved uh, in such frontier zones are not even states, but they have been created by a multitude of states, and therefore they have um, a status which is not that of states, but rather something something in between. Um, and in, in this concept, I think it is useful to return to um, a book which was published right after the Second World War by a sufficiently notorious uh, political scholar a very conservative political scholar, uh, Carl Schmidt, but who nevertheless in this book, in his book, The Nomos of the Earth, uh, shares some insights that are also linked to Hannah Arendt's um, political theory and strangely also to that of uh, Gilles Deleuze and uh, Felix Guattari. Because in fact, the very idea of Nomos is being discussed in uh, A Thousand Plateaus, but also in The Nomos uh, of the Earth. But uh, Carl Schmidt and um, on the one hand, and the others, and Guattari go to rather distinct ways how do they how they deal with uh, the idea of the monarchy. But in this book, we find the following quote that I would like to read. Um, Kashmir notes that the freedom of internal <coughs> land appropriation in the United States ended. Uh, the moment the freedom of internal land appropriation in the United States ended, the meaning of the fundamental order of the United States, the radical title, changed. The open doors to the old refuge of unlimited freedom closed when laws were introduced that limited immigration and became discriminatory, in part for racial and in part for economic reasons. Keen observers immediately recognized the change. The change. One great philosopher and typical thinker of American pragmatism, John Dewey, seems to me to be particularly noteworthy. It took the end of the frontier as the starting point of his consideration of the concrete social situation of America. This is obviously a very provocative statement because it suggests that uh, America was basically a no man's land. There were no people living here before the arrival uh, of the Europeans. This is obviously one side of the very provocation of, of, of Carl Schmidt, but the other side of it is that, well, 
America becomes concrete, it becomes uh, a concrete democratic space only the moment um, the, the process of land appropriation came to an end. And this is, coincides more or less with the time where the first immigration laws or the, the first strict immigration laws uh, were passed. It is interesting that in this context, uh, Schmidt uses the, the English term frontier. Uh, and the frontier for him is really um, um, a chronological problem because it's, it's, it's neither referring to political space that is settled, nor can one say that a frontier is unsettled. <coughs> it's something in between, it's something shifting, it's something which is not clearly defined, at least not by uh, a sovereign state. And for me, it is also interesting that uh, A.L. Weizmann, in a book that was um, published just shortly after um, Karl Schmidt's book became available in, in English, uses the very same uh, the, the same concept, that of frontier. In fact, he argues that um, the frontier has a particular logic uh, that cannot be equated with that of borders, and he uses uh, Israel as, as a paradigmatic situation. Uh, because he is able to illustrate that um, the wall acts more like a, a membrane. It, it acts uh, as something which is, is living. It's almost like a living organism, and it's organized in such a way uh, as to share some resemblances with an airport. You have security checks uh, on different levels, you have different entries, uh, different ways out, but it's certainly not a, a Euclidean, one-dimensional uh, space. This is not to, to suggest that there was ever something like a clearly defined Euclidean, um, uh, Westphalian political space, but rather as to suggest that uh, this uh, political imagination or this um, spatial imagination of um, clearly defined political and national space seems nowadays to come more to an end uh, than ever. And uh, in this context then, new actors become visible, especially in the European Union. I think that a lot of what um, Weizmann has to say about Israel can be transposed or translated to um, European situations, even though there are obviously also some major differences. But one can, for, for example, argue that this uh, newly created uh, agency called Frontex in Europe is truly paradigmatic in the sense that it was created by the European Council uh, so as to supplement the different individual member states and associated states of the European Union. So it's not a state actor, but it's a, an actor which supplements the activities, the broad activities of the European Union. And by doing so, it does, in effect, uh, create situations of insecurity because uh, no state, not Germany, not Italy, who are deploying part of the border police in such uh, mixed missions has the sovereign right to, to control these missions. So basically it's impossible for Germany or for Italy to control what is happening in these missions. It's impossible to, for example, know how many uh, people were arrested, how many people were sent back, how many people uh, uh, with disability were detected, so how many people with uh, uh, special needs were, were there. For uh, the parliamentarians in, in Germany or in Italy, it's impossible to, to hold Frontex accountable. And so we see that new actors become visible that are supplementing the state and they create uh, uh, zones of insecurity. And here it becomes important to ask the question how can uh, new spaces of appearance be created? And um, very much before I would argue that where there is power there is always resistance. And there is not just one general refusal, but there are many different sites and many different spaces and many different forms of resistance. In, in my essay, I'm, I'm addressing three particular examples so as to illustrate that uh, spaces of appearance can be created in many different ways. There's not just one way of creating uh, such spaces of appearance. But I'm referring to the, the, the current refugee strikes in, in uh, different European countries, for example, nowadays. They're interesting because they are reappropriating the name refugee in, in, a, in, a, in a fashion that is, again, not state-based, but that is transnational. And the, the, main, the major claim within the context of such refugee strikes is that we are entitled to our future. A very basic and very general demand, but it's a demand which contradicts especially the contemporary logic of uh, creating a situation where there is no future for many of the unemployed people, for all those people who still believe that within 
uh, a classical notion of uh, Westphalian governmentality that can be uh, a better future. And what they're doing is that they're they are putting themselves together in, in such a fashion that uh, they are exemplifying um, this unqualified multitude of people with different origins that cannot be traced back to one specific nationality, but they are really presenting a demos without a specific space, without a specific police. But they are putting together, they are putting in common a wrong, and therefore they are also demanding uh, a new space of appearance. Another example of, uh, of a space of appearance which is being created in a more academic sense is um, Forensic Architecture, a project which uh, was especially initiated by Al Weizmann at Goldsmiths, where he's uh, using forensic in this double sense of, on the one hand, a forum where people come together and they are discussing evidence, uh, evidence of violence, uh, but forum uh, forensic also in the sense of creating such an evidence. So one particular project within this context was that of uh, forensic oceanography, where different scholars, uh, Charles Heller and Pizzani, were collecting evidence of the massive disappearances in the Mediterranean Sea in order to counter also the, the, the generalized indifference that nobody really knows what is happening in the Mediterranean Sea because there are many incidents that are known as the left-to-die boats, boats that are drifting in the Mediterranean Sea for several weeks where up to 60 people die at once after having been drifted for 60 days where no, none of the passing by boats uh, has this particular interest of helping these people. And by creating such evidence, by using drift models, by talking to witnesses, they create a new forum also and they create new forms of accountability. A third example, and with which uh, I will conclude, that I'm also using in, in my paper is uh, that of an artistic um, effort of uh, questioning our sense of hospitality project by two Swiss-based uh, artists, um, Wacht and Jud, who created a hotel. They call it Hotel Gellem. Gellem is a, is a Roma word, uh, and it's part of a Roma song. And what they are doing in, in this project is they are inverting and subverting the very sense of location and of, of hospitality, because these hotels are located in, in Roma villages and in uh, Roma camps. And they are organized so that those who would like to visit these camps have to apply. And all of a sudden, it's the, the, the Romans living there who have, let's say, the right to decide whether or not they invite this or that person. Um, the two artists are not suggesting that they are, by this, um, solving problems, but they are trying to engage with spaces so that one can, that all the people involved can question that the space of belonging and they can also question very much um, what they understand by hospitality and what it could mean and what it could take to, to rearrange uh, our space of appearance. So having said this, I would like to, to argue that um, the, the contemporary tendency to diffuse um, a state-based sense of jurisdiction and accountability is definitely a very ambivalent situation, but it does certainly also involve the opportunity and the chance of engaging uh, in, in different ways uh, with the opportunity of, of rearranging uh, spaces of appearance and also of uh, collective uh, uh, responsibility and uh, agency. Thank you.